I'm talking about the idea that you can make something that will swim out of two spheres alone, connected by a spring. This is a, a mock-up of it. The real object is in a cell over here, a red sphere above a glass sphere. The idea is that the lower sphere is denser, the glass, and the upper sphere is plastic, it's a less dense. So these two spheres have different sizes, but the, the important thing is they have different densities. So although it's, the whole thing is neutrally buoyant, the sphere at the top is being pulled up and the sphere at the bottom is being pulled down. So that spring is being stretched. First we've got to make one of these on a smaller scale. Are they hard to make? They, they look fiddly. Yeah, they're a nightmare. You've got a big sphere and a little sphere and you've got to connect them by a coil that's uh, vaguely spring-shaped and you've got to wind that round a rod like this and then you've got to very carefully get the glue on one end and the glue on the other. If you get too much glue then it gets too heavy and it sinks and if you don't get enough glue it might be too light. When I press this switch it just causes this loudspeaker to oscillate. So this is going up, at, up and down at about 50 hertz, so the same frequency as your light bulbs. So it's very difficult to see under these lighting conditions, but this, the surface of the speaker is going up and down. So it's accelerating alternately, it's accelerating that way and then that way, rapidly, backwards and forwards. We're going to shake this object inside a liquid and then the lighter sphere will move one way and the denser sphere will move the other and it will go like that. And similarly with this top sphere, that gets propelled forwards at a higher acceleration than the, the sphere. So what happens is that when the thing is accelerating upwards, it stretches like that. So as you shake it up and down, this one wants to stay where it is, that one wants to move much more. And so with, that, that one wants to go with the flow. Go with the flow, as you put it. So what, what do we mean by swimming? Well, what, what we mean by swimming is that we've got an object in some liquid, perhaps, and in order to propel itself along this object, it has to, the object has to deform in some way, it has to move its body parts in some way. It turns out that when, uh, for objects that are moving very slowly, or very, very small objects in water, such as bacterium, if they, in, in such a case, vis the viscosity of the water is very important. And you find that if you do a stroke in which you, uh, a so-called reciprocal stroke, in which the stroke looks the same forwards in time as backwards in time. So if I'm trying a stroke like that, and then if I'm, a, you have to imagine I'm doing this either very slowly or I'm very small, that will just propel me forwards when I do that and then backwards again when I do that. And we go nowhere. So that's a stroke in which if you run the video forwards and back or backwards in time, you can't, you can't tell just from looking at that stroke whether the video is being run forwards or backwards in time. An object like a bacterium, which is very small and which is living in a world dominated by, by viscosity, it's living at a very low Reynolds number, it has to develop another trick in order to be able to swim. So it can't use a stroke like this, which looks the same forwards or backwards in time. It has to develop some other type of stroke. So one way, for example, a, a bacterium could do it, for example, an E. coli bacterium, is, to, is it's got a little whip-like tail on the back. And it rotates that round just like a corkscrew. And that motion, you can tell, it's not time symmetrical. There are other tricks as well. I mean, you, the, the bacteria can use little cilia, little hairs that move along the edge of its body, and that can propel it through the liquid. So here, when we're, if, we, if we oscillate it at a small amplitude, it's a little bit like the bacterium. It's living at low Reynolds number. And because this is a time-reversible motion, it's going to go nowhere. So what we've done is that we keep increasing the amplitude until the inertia of the liquid becomes important. And at that point, it starts to swim. Why? Essentially, the, the inertia of the liquid can rectify the motion, this oscillating motion. So it can turn oscillating motion into a jet of liquid that comes out of the bottom. And this jet of liquid is what propels the spheres along. It was cool, but it happens so quickly in real life, you have to go back and watch the video to see if it was actually interesting or not. So when we went back and watched the video, we saw this huge jet being propelled out of the bottom sphere and a couple of vortices above the big sphere. So yeah, yeah, it became really interesting retrospectively. I'm too clumsy to do this. Mike did that. Then you put it in the cell. You then have to get all the liquid in here stationary. You have to make sure the density of this is exactly right to get it to float in the middle. I forgot about the bubbles. Yeah, bubbles, right. So if we, 
Yeah, so this solution is salt water, but we have to put it under vacuum for a while first. If there's air in the cell, halfway through, a little bubble will appear on the top surface of this thing, and it will rise to the top and you'll get a false reading. So you're constantly going against nature's desire to screw this experiment up. The interesting question is, how does this such an object, or any object, make a transition to swimming? So at low Reynolds number, with a low amplitude of oscillation, it's not swimming. It's just like the bacterium that, that, can't, that can't swim with a reciprocal motion. And we keep increasing the amplitude, suddenly it starts to swim, and it goes off. We get this jet of liquid underneath it. Or is it a smooth transition? So does it start at, if we start very, very low speeds, does it gradually start moving with faster and faster uh, speed? And so what we seem to have found with this experiment is that there is indeed a transition between not swimming and we reach a critical amplitude and it starts swimming. This is one of these problems which mathematicians have worried about. They don't know how to deal with this exactly. And they write equations down which work for small velocities or, you know, if you were doing this in treacle. But they don't correspond to the real world. This has fallen through the gaps of mathematical analysis computing. You have to do this damned experiment. I said that before and people complained that I was swearing. But you have to do that in order to make sure you're not fooling yourself. bash together so many times that they almost come to a standstill and when they made a little cluster another one comes in and bashes it and it makes a little cluster. Because of the inelasticity, the, the energy loss in these collisions, there's a, a, a likelihood that they will cluster together and form little clusters.